Everybody, welcome to this study that we are having in the book of Revelation on the seven churches. And what we're going to go over today is the significance of the church at Sardis. And just to put right out front is it is going to be a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is definitely going to be a revelation of his work as the second Adam, as he lays upon the cross and finds himself to be propitiation for our sins and that he is bearing our curse. And it is a picture of his second coming. It is a huge picture in which he bore something we could never bear. And in regards to his humanity, it's so essential for us to take comfort that we have a mediator that is without spot, without blemish before God. And you're thinking, how in the world are you going to get this out of the church at Sardis? And it's going to be easy once you finally start seeing it and putting some of the pieces together. Remember, anytime that you're studying the book of Revelation, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That is your primary fix on your on your perspective. You fix your perspective on, well, how is it so in Christ? And then the Holy Spirit, who's always testifying of Christ, who has promised to reveal all things in which Christ has spoken in regards to himself, will bring to mind the scriptures. Don't be searching out other applications first. It's going to only confuse you. So if you just seek the truth as it is in Christ, the Holy Spirit, and praying for the Holy Spirit, praying for the humility that Christ is going to be glorified in the pursuit of the gospel, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation and the spotlight on the work of Jesus Christ, in which we could fix ourselves to the anchor and the hope and the rock that we have uh, before God. This is essential. So without any more delay, let's get into our study. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is the fifth branch on the seven-branch candlestick. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We're going to be studying over that on the next broadcast. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Also needing to be fleshed out. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Very important phrase. That they are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, now you have received what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, be watchful. I will come upon you as a thief, and you will know you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Yes, we will study out on another broadcast, Thief in the Night. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Definitely to be studied out. He o who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Very interesting around the garments and Sardis. I will not blot out his name for the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Very important phrase to not go by quickly. <coughs> Again, the voice of the Holy Spirit to harden not our hearts. The same voice that was seeking Adam in the cool of the day, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto his assemblies, to his gatherings, those who gather in his name. Okay. So what we're going to look at here is really this study is going to be about Sardis itself, the city, but what does the name mean? And why is that name significant in our understanding of the full spectrum of the revelation of Jesus Christ as we look at the seven churches? Again, we look at the seven churches as a form of Gilgal. It's where God winds up his people like Galilee Christ is Galal he circles the Gentiles the circle of the Gentiles 
a wife circles her husband seven times in a Jewish wedding. The uh, children of Israel regarding the walls of Jericho, they're circling, circling, circling. And then God sends them off like David with his sling. And then the stone is set out. And you will see that this is what the seven churches are. You must go over the entire spectrum of the light, the spectrum of light, which is the seven churches where Christ is in the midst of them, and they all bear revelation to Christ. You cannot bypass that idea and say, but I want machine guns, and I want battleships, and I want satellites, and I want locust uh, plagues, and I want helicopters. And I want all these more exciting, thrilling bubblegum card versions of the book of Revelation. But I just don't want it to be the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm super bored by that. We are going to painstakingly let it be the revelation of Jesus Christ so you are not tossed to and fro with every fanciful idea of everyone who is a circus carny, barker, selling you a bill of goods in regard to the book of Revelation, only keeping you hopped up on excitement. we got to get past that. We have to be grounded in the truth as it is in Christ. And Sardis is huge. Sardis is a major, major cornerstone, as you will see. First, let's get into this picture of what Sardis is, the history of it. Let's get into it. Check it out. All right, so the history of Sardis. During this its time, first century, it remained an important city and was the principal center of a judicial district that included almost 30 Lydian and Phrygian settlements. This is all Persian. This is the end of the road of Persia, and it was a huge, major, important Persian uh, uh, outpost uh, in the empire, you'll see. The city was eventually made a uh, provincial capital when Lydia was established as an administrative center. Listen to this. The life of Sardis began as a hilltop citadel where the king of Lydia lived. Sardis was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia, one of the most important cities in the Persian Empire. And we'll get into this Persian idea in a little bit. In the Persian era, Sardis was conquered by Cyrus the Great. Cyrus. Remember drying up the uh, rivers of Euph Euphrates? And formed the end station for the Persian royal road, which began in Persopolis, the capital of Persia. Cyrus is said to have taken $600 million worth of treasure from the city when he captured it. Sardis was the site of the most important Persian satrapy, which is basically government officials, heads of state. Sardis remained under Persian domination until it surrendered to Alexander the Great. In 334 BC, Sardis discovered the secret of, are you ready for this, separating gold from silver, thereby producing both metals of a purity never known before, currency. This was an economic revolution for while gold nuggets panned or mind were used for as currency, their purity was always suspect and a hindrance to trade. Such nuggets or coinage was naturally uh, were naturally occurring alloys of gold and silver known as electrum, and one could never know how much of it was gold and how much of it was silver. Sardis now could mint nearly pure silver and gold coins, the value of which and was trusted throughout the known world. They were the standard, the gold standard of currency. They were the currency center of the world. Is there a spiritual application to the economy of Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary's cross? We'll have to look into that. Is there a connection to the concept of, quote, Cyrus the Great, the Persian kingdom, this releasing you from Babylon? We'll take a look at that. This revolution made Sardis rich, and Croesus, named uh, synonymous, excuse me, uh, uh, what, what name was synonymous with wealth itself. For this reason, Sardis is famed in history as the place where modern currency was invented. Currency. Very, very interesting when you get into the concepts of redemption. 
Sardis was a center for the traffic of goods, ideas between Mesopotamia and the Greek Ionian settlements, a crossroad of trade, an ideal meeting point for the exchange of ideas, beliefs, customs, knowledge, and new insights. It was the happening place. It was the center of the world in so many ways. This rich exchange of, excuse me, was one of the factors that around 600 BC allowed the Ionian cities to turn into the intellectual leaders of the Greek world. The first large-scale hierarchical, now this is very interesting, archaeological expedition in Sardis was by Princeton University back in the early, you know, turn of the 20th century, unearthing a huge temple to Artemis, which became one of the seven wonders of the world. And this is, it's kind of uh, equal in Ephesus in this way, whose worship was very similar to the pagan goddess Diana in Ephesus. Check this out. It stood on the northern slope of Mount Timulus. Its acropolis occupied one of the spurs of the mountain. At the base flowed the river Pactolus, which served as a moat, rendering the city practically impregnable. So they became presumptuous and unwatchful. You'll see the admonition of that church. Through the failure to watch, however, the acropolis had been successfully scaled in upper Sardis because there was an upper and lower and had a lack of defense of all protecting the lower city. And it was obviously not a very wise choice. The lower town settlements remain unchanged, seemed to imply that its church members did not finish what they had started. And they were about image and substance. That was a commentary. Homes <clears throat> were made of reeds in that lower area. A Greek army marched upon Sardis and burned it to the ground. And when a soldier set one of the houses on fire, the flames spread rapidly from house to house until they engulfed the entire city. Even to this day in Turkey, there was a Robin Hood-like tale of robbers that come down from the mountains, such as, I could never really pronounce it, Shak il Jali to Sardis. And this is what was read in one of the inscriptions that they found. In the archaeological dig, yonder among the mountains overhanging Sardis, there was a robber gang led by notorious Shakir Jali. He rules in the mountains, so government force, no government force can take him. Again and again, he swoops down like an eagle out of the sky in one corner of the region or another. From time immemorial, these mountains have been the haunts of such robbers. It is written, and it was written in the stones there. He comes as a thief in the night. Now, this is fascinating. Because what you're going to have here is even the concept of Persian, the whole Persian influence there and the economy. When Christ is up on Calvary's cross, he used a Persian word to talk to the thief on the cross, says, surely you shall be with me in paradise. That is a borrowed Persian word because in the Persian culture, the king would have a large garden that he would have as a display for his dream or his ideal or the template for how he wants to build his entire kingdom. Solomon had done the same thing. He took that kind of concept. The idea of the Garden of Eden is a picture of that, that God says, this is my footstool, and I want you to see the model that I have. I want you to come to my elaborate garden, and you're going to get a sample version of how I want my entire kingdom to be. So it's going to be beautiful and manicured. It's going to be hanging gardens and waterfalls and exotic animals. And it's going to be peace, peaceable and, and tranquil and glorious and exotic and wonderful. And so the idea of paradise, where we get the word Persia or Ufarsan, many, many shekel Ufares. It's the idea of where we get Paris from or Parisian. And that's even where Paris was, you know, this was, that was the end to the Persian Empire. And so it was this idea of paradise, paradisio, in which there is beauty and tranquility and everything that God had intended for us. And it was modeled in the Garden of Eden. And so a Persian king would have, quote, as a footstool, in other words, the Ottoman Empire, that's where you get the whole Ottoman from, it's a footstool. And it was the idea of creating this very, beautiful and elaborate and extravagant and opulent kingdom. 
wherever they quote this king places his feet is basically the idea is it's going to beautify, enrich, and create a very uh, optimal kingdom. And so Christ actually borrows a Persian word up on Calvary's cross. Fascinating. Thief in the night concept there. Being watchful, the upper city seemed to be very well protected, and it was through this moat, and there's a great gulf fix that nobody can cross unless you were bidden. But the lower region, kind of like here on earth, we have heaven and then we have earth, is it was unguarded, unprotected, and all the houses were made of reeds, and it was easily overrun and sacked easily. And so you're going to see a lot of parallels that in the city, and it's the center of purging gold and silver, faith, trial, tests. And you're going to see as we kind of move through this concept of what Sardis is, because Sardis was a stone in the Old Testament that was on the breastplate of the high priest. And what we're going to look at here is the word Sardis in the Old Testament is the word that we use to name the name Adam. Odom, root word Adam, which means red, ruddy. And it's the picture of the first Adam, Reuben. And we're going to look at how this was the first stone put upon the breastplate. And it was, are you ready for this? The chief corner stone, the firstborn. And you're also going to see parts where it says that you are dead but alive. There is this weird contradiction. That language is used for Joseph when he was sold into slavery and then they presented his blood-drenched garments dipped in blood, rolled in blood, was presented to the father. He says, my son is dead, but yet the son was alive. He became a redeemer. And you're going to see in our study that Reuben was disqualified because he was the firstborn, but he defiled his position. And so who took his place? Joseph became the firstborn who was alive and dead. And he became this kind of picture of triumph and resurrection at, after he was betrayed by his brethren and bore the curse and came back triumphant. You're going to see this. So let's look at the idea of the word Sardis in the Old Testament. Let's kind of get orientated around how this is a picture of firstborn, inheritance, and this picture in which Christ bore the curse for us. Check this out. So in Exodus chapter 28, verse 17 says, and you shall set it in settings of stones, four rows of stones. The first row shall be Sardis. And then it goes into the other stones. And you're going to understand this was a chief cornerstone. Exodus 28, verse 17 says, Mount four rows of gemstones on it. The first row will contain red cardillion. This is the same verse, but different translations. This is NASB, shall be ruby. This is HNV, row Odom. And the, it's the word Odom or Adam. It is pictured as something red or dyed red, red skinned, red stained. And you're going to see here how this is a picture where Reuben, if you want, actually, if you want to look at, uh, like this, I want to show you guys something real quick, is right here is. Um, If I can zoom in a little bit more. Anyway, as you'll see here, right here is where the first stone is Reuben on the breastplate of the high priest. And that's the chief cornerstone right here. And you're going to see where Christ became the chief cornerstone. And this is a Sardis stone. These are all Sardis stones, you guys. And you're going to see where Christ became the first begotten the firstborn of the dead, that he becomes the, quote, Adam, and he will be hung. This is actually right here. This is an actual Sardis stone. It has these weird marks in it. 
very fascinating how you're going to see how it represents the work of Christ up on Calvary's cross, not just by visual, but in every theological sense of the word. It's very fascinating stuff. Okay. So what we're going to look at here, and we're going to move through, is how Reuben failed as a firstborn, and Reuben is representational of Adam, a natural inheritor by designation of God in the order of God, and then he fails, he defiles his position, and then he is, quote, unstable as water. And you're going to look how Christ, quote, stabilized us. They carved the names on these stones, and it's a picture of how Christ takes something that is transitory, something that is unstable, and then he becomes that rock. He stabilizes us. He finishes our work. He writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He has based upon his own establishment of what is righteousness, and God required the righteousness of a man for this covenant. An atonement of a man, a perfection of a man, the obedience of a man. God entered into a covenant of life with a man, with men, with Adam. Eat and live. Don't eat and live. <laughs> you know, you eat of this tree, you can eat of the other trees. Don't eat of this tree, you die. This was the covenant. And then it was the same thing on Mount Sinai and forever and always will be righteousness will be the standard in which God can say you've lived up to the covenant. You have met the righteous requirements of the covenant. Therefore, I see you as a covenant keeper. Therefore, you are in a covenantal oneness with me. If you don't think that's important, you know nothing about eternal life. You know nothing about the scripture. You know nothing about Genesis to Revelation because that is the obsession of all the revelation of Jesus Christ is you must have eternal life only by the requirements of righteous, perfect obedience. Hey, God bless Morocco and that American that is there. So what you're going to see here, you guys, is that we failed. Reuben failed. Adam failed. Christ prevailed. Christ succeeded. Christ overcame. And he bore our garments so we can bear his garments. And that is the huge theme of the church at Sardis. Cornerstone stuff, you guys. This is essential that we understand the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. All right. Let's get into our study. So, Reuben, <clears throat> which is very fascinating, the flag that was around the sanctuary, there were four main flags, and then each tribe had a flag, but Reuben was a flag of a man. Just a flag of a man. I could find that. I didn't even think of finding that picture, but it's it's out there. And what Reuben means is, behold a son or look upon a son, look upon this one that is held up before you. That's what the word Reuben means. And so we're going to look at the idea of why was Christ upheld like a serpent upon a tree when Jesus had that conversation with Nicodemus. And this idea of hanging between heaven and earth, look upon him, behold the man. And this is so essential that we um, understand this, you guys, because... God wants us to look upon him and whom we have pierced, who bore our sins, who hung between heaven and earth, and what's the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, fell upon that, quote, covenantal man, Jesus Christ, the second Adam or the last Adam, the ultimate Adam, ultra Adam. He took the scepter from the hand of the failed Adam, entered into the covenant, and had to succeed where Adam failed. He had to succeed in the three essentials of temptation, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He had to prevail as the head of humanity. And he then just comes as one that can ascend to heaven, represent us as a high priest, mediate for us, and say, look not upon whomsoever, but look upon me, who is the perfection of a covenant of obligation. I entered into the world born of a woman, born under the law, born under obligatory covenantal promise of obedience. 
This is everything to us, that there was the obedience of a perfect man. It's not just a perfect man, but he had to have divine capacity to be a mediator for whomsoever, an eternal quality about him. But he had to enter into covenantal perfection as a man and not lay a hold of his divinity in order to replenish himself in any way or to supply for himself. He had to be the covenantal total dependent man. And yes, it was a temptation to his humanity to lay a hold of his divinity in many times. And the father says, you can't, you have to fulfill the covenant of a man. And the humanity of Jesus Christ is so essential to us, we don't understand it. We don't understand Calvary's cross. We don't understand his suffering. We don't understand a temptation. We don't understand why God would have to humiliate himself to enter into humanity, relinquish his throne in that way, and then do a start over point as the God man, and then have to succeed even at the trial and judgment of his own people, be crucified, be condemned in every sense of the word, be sealed in a tomb, and then to triumph, and then to arise and mediate man before God. We don't know the epic, gargantuan, eternal, infinite mission that he was on. And it was a great gulf that was fixed. There was no way it could be fixed. There was no way sin was too big that it took God himself to come in flesh to shed his blood and to be a man to do it. And he had to do it as a, quote, inheritor. He had to do it as a firstborn, quote, one that is a basar. The word basar in Hebrew is the idea of what? Of to be an inheritor. To a bazaar means to have all the riches, to have everything gathered towards him. He is the one that is the, quote, sense of what a firstborn is. It's not like it's just the order of a firstborn. Like, well, you're first. Well, then why did Joseph become a firstborn once Reuben failed? It's telling you firstborn is a title. It is headship. And Christ took the reins in which Adam had failed and fell under the dominion of Satan. Did The pull of death came upon the human family. Condemnation was the banner over all of humanity because we came from the condemned loins of Adam. Like it or not, that's just the truth. The reality is that Christ had to come and he failed. I'm excuse me, where Adam failed, Christ prevailed. Where Adam had a crushing, epic defeat, Christ was epically triumphant. And this is pictured in this bloodbath called Sardis. This bearing the curse, Sardis. Washed in blood, Sardis. Bearing the guilt, Sardis. You're going to see it. That we are saved by his red blood and that he had to have his blood shed. And he entered into a horrific horror show in which he had to bear the sins of the world upon himself. And he had to be hung between heaven and earth. Yes, as a thief. Between thieves. Not an accidental connection there, you guys. And you'll see that he was the, the son, the true son, the chief cornerstone son. He prevailed where humanity failed. And you're going to see, especially with Reuben, that Reuben, who is a picture of humanity, says with that flag of a man, says humans with their promises, with their oaths, with the covenants that they enter into with, with their high level promises are as weak as water. They're shifting. If there's a wind on the water, it blows up into high waves and passions when there is no wind there's it's tranquil and beautiful and peaceful shifting 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 can god cannot build on sand he builds upon the rock all right let's go so genesis 29 verses 31 32 says and when the lord saw that leah was unloved that's a whole story in itself he opened up her womb but rachel was barren very interesting how these parallels happen in other parts of the scripture. So Leah con conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she says this, the Lord has surely looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And this is a bizarre picture of salvation. 
It's interesting. Fascinating view of salvation. But look at this. This is this whole Jacob's blessing <laughs> on the 12 tribes. Reuben, you are my firstborn, a type of Adam. Man, my might and the beginning of my strength. He's a picture of the first Adam, guys. The excellency of dignity. Remember, God had made him Adam that way. And the excellency of power gave him dominion. But unstable as water, and you shall not excel, Reuben slash Adam. Because what did you do? You went up to your father's bed and you defiled it, and you went up to my couch. I want to have to touch on this real quick before we move on. How did Reuben, when he took one of the concubines from his father and defiled his father's bed chamber, how is that a picture of what happened in the Garden of Eden? What is the bedchamber? What is the Holy of Holies? What is the inner sanctum of the house? What is that special place in which there is a shakin, a shekinah, a resting, a bed, a place of nakedness, which angels desire to look into as covering cherubs? The Holy of Holies is a picture of God's bedchamber. And the Garden of Eden, which was a chamber within the rest of the world, was a bedchamber, his footstool. And in the Song of Solomon, that is pictured as a bedchamber. You know, the pillars of our bed are as the cedars, etc. And what's so fascinating about this idea of the Garden of Eden, it was God laying himself open as naked on the cool of the day at the even time. At the even time where God did not have any hierarchy. A husband and wife, when they're in the bed in intimacy, it's even. There is something very atoning around two becoming one. To be naked and unashamed. Why do you think you had them naked and unashamed? It is a bedchamber. The Garden of Eden was a picture of us being invited into the most intimate of relationships with God in which there is feeding or eat of this fruit. Don't eat of this. Everything else I've given for you to have. To bear the expenses of this thing, don't eat of this tree. I will bear that. I can live where there is no life. You cannot. Take from my batter sheet. Take from my fat. Take from my abundance. Take from me just filling up these chambers that I create for you so you can be lavishly adorned, so you can be opulently provided for. That's the Garden of Eden. That's where the idea of God created, bear a sheet. As a husband and the intimate relationship that God had with humanity was a picture of him securing a bride for himself. And allowing a third party to come in and to eat of that fruit is adultery. It's defiling the marriage bed. And we don't understand of how much it was so violating to God that it created death and misery and dissension. And immediately, they're putting on costumes and garments and blame shifting, and everyone's blaming each other. And it created bruises and death. And the expulsion from that bedchamber. Get out. I had such a thing happen in my life. First time I ever went to a type of a church service, somebody invited me for Easter. A friend wanted me to house her friend. She was married to this guy named Bob. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, I have a friend coming in from Utah, Moab, Utah. Can he stay at your place? Sure, sure. Yeah, he's a friend of mine and Bob's, and he has no place to stay. I come home. It's a studio apartment. They're, being, they're having sex on my futon as I walk in the door. It's the first time I ever visited a church. And I caught them on my bed. Cheating. She's cheating on her husband with this, quote, friend of the family. In my bed, when I'm in the middle of having a horrific trauma in my own life where the person that I was with, that I was in a covenant with, she was having a sexual relationship with some guy at her work and also my father at the same time. So I walk into this nightmarish hellscape that the whole world seems to be in violation 
of the basic covenant of a relationship that was truly heart ripping. And even the book of Malachi says that divorce is as violence to the soul. It's the tearing of your soul. And God says, you have to go. You have to go. It's the word that he literally, that he cast them out or that he sent them out is the word get, like get out. And it's the same word for divorce in Hebrew, a get. Go ahead, go go to a, a, a Orthodox Jewish community and say, when you get a thing called a get, what is that? I said, it's, it's, a, it's a divorce, it's a bill of divorce. A get, it means to get, go, go, get out, go. You ruined it all. And that was Reuben. And that was Adam. And that is us. So how's that reconciled? Through lots of pain, lots of suffering. And the picture of Joseph is a picture of redeeming the very thing that Reuben had destroyed. And Joseph was brought through a crucible and he became one that was a kinsman redeemer for his brethren. And you'll see this played out here. Remember, what does Reuben mean? To look upon, look, behold the man, the bloody man, the one in whom is being pierced for your sins. Behold the man, Pontius Pilate says. Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, the true son, obedient, glorifying the father. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. Change of plans. You're going to see the same picture here of what Reuben means, which is behold the man. Look at him. There's the son. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 says, And I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They shall what? Look upon me whom they've pierced. Look. There he is. There's our sins. There's the, quote, currency of heaven. That is the redemption money. That's the difference between silver and gold, my friends. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only, grieved as one for him, as one who grieves for what? A firstborn, Reuben. But it's Joseph that was dead but alive. For some reason, the teachers in Israel just didn't get it. They didn't understand the fundamentals, the plan of salvation. And what does Jesus say? He has this conversation with Nicodemus who comes in the middle of the night, who's ashamed to even be associated with Jesus Christ, but saw the, the divinity of God flashing through that humanity. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, Reuben, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you have to understand this idea of, whoops, oh, I guess I can have all these up at the same time. That's kind of cool. Oh, why not just have this like this? So what is this picture here, you guys? Born again is, he's showing this. This is going to be the picture here that he's going to talk to Nicodemus about. This is what it means to be born again. This is what it means right here. This was the, the birthstone to the firstborn. This is Reuben's stone. And we need a redo. We need an entire history redone. Humanity needs to be born again in another Adam. And you're going to see this played out all through the Old and New Testament, you need a firstborn, a redo of a firstborn. You have a failed firstborn. You have a failed holder of the birthright. He despised the birthright. Why did God, quote, hate Esau and love Jacob? Because the firstborn lightly esteemed the birthright. And it was horrifying. And his name was called what? He was an Adamite, Edomite. I'm talking about Esau here. Why did God call him an Edomite? 
Red. It's the word for Sardis. He's a firstborn. He had the natural rights and he completely lowly esteemed it. He saw very little value in it. And then just cast it away that there was not, nothing of value. He says, what? So I'm not going to live from this. I'm going to die. Give me my red beans, my Adam, Adam. That's what it says, a bowl of Adam, Adam. We said lentils, whatever, red, red beads. In which Christ shed on that sacred forehead. Go back to our study. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You are condemned. Reuben slash Adam. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And he says, listen, man, you don't. Uh, are you talking epic here? Or are you just talking fleshy, materialistic, carnal? Most assuredly. I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. That which is born in the flesh and that which is born the, uh, of the spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Why is Christ saying this to him? Because the whole concept of being, quote, oh, I'm sorry, I should have been showing you guys this, showing the stream. He's telling him right here. Why are you marveling at this idea that you have to be born again? Because even the book of 1 Corinthians that talks about the second Adam, the last Adam, that Christ is now the, quote, first begotten of the dead. The book of Revelation makes it abundantly clear. He's the first begotten of the dead. We're thinking, well, Moses was raised before him. No, no, you don't understand. He is the true and ultra archetypical inheritor. And that situation I was telling you about with my, quote, friend who had me house that guy, yeah, I cast them out. They flung up, they jumped in my closet, which was wide open because it was the studio, and they're trying to cover themselves with my clothes. And I said, get out, get out right now. Get out, get your stuff out of there. And it was a huge crisis turning point. I don't want to live in this world anymore. I was so sick and tired of this. I just said, I can't stand being here. And it was from that point that God finally said, okay, my way, my way only, David. Follow me. The rest of the world has gone the way of your friend, of your ex, of your father, of everybody. The whole world is like swept away in a massive form of violence and uh, uh, adultery and defilement. And I got it. I got it in my soul. I got for the first time, maybe God feels this way. Maybe this is the sickening vomiting experience of God in which he's going to vomit his people out of his mouth because he cannot have this inside of him, his soul. It's too much. The book of Jeremiah says, my heart beats wildly. I can't live with this. I cannot live with a harlot who violates me endlessly. This is the bridegroom who submits his own life to pay the dowry. Look at the currency of Sardis. Purified seven times. Look at him up there. Behold the man can't you see him hanging between heaven and earth, bearing our reproach, bearing our curse, paying the redemption price? Why are you shocked? Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and says, are you? The teacher of Israel, the head teacher of Israel, and you do not even know these things? You guys, this is so fundamental to the scripture. And I know people who seem to know a bunch of scripture and a bunch of theological points, and they study, you know, systematic theology. They study the great theologians. They study this school of thought and that school of thought, and they're really into making these points in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. They really love talking about the various kind of grammatical structures that's in the Bible and the historical philology in which they are dissecting and they are exegeting a text and et cetera. And they're really showing off all of the wares and 
their expertise, but they're nothing more than blind scribes and Pharisees. The entire revelation of God is lost, but yet they bear the name theologian, self-titled, self-serving, idle, with your puffy hat, marching around with your robes in your little document with a little bow around it. But you don't know this. You really don't get the plight of humanity. You don't get that you are all drowning in your blood. You are all defiled. You are all going to be condemned with the first Adam. There's no hope. I'm a holy God and I require holiness. You think God let down the standard of holiness and righteousness because we sinned? No. He kept the standard. He established the law. And he came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Hence, Christ. And yet you're a teacher. You're the teacher of Israel. And yet you don't even comprehend this. You must be born again is the gospel. The word basar is the word for gospel. The word basar is for elect or chosen. Why are we debating about what election or being chosen? It's talking about the only begotten, firstborn, qualified son who is Christ. He is the chosen one. And if you are in him by faith, you get to share in the merits and lay a hold of the benefits of heirship, of the commonwealth, of rightful standing with paradise. God never relinquishes his righteousness and his holiness for sin. But his holiness was displayed upon Calvary's cross that he bears our guilt and shame. If we choose to what? Come to terms with it and see the value of what happened on Calvary's cross and understand how it dragged God from his throne in which he bore our sins and look at the shame of it. That should have been us upon Calvary's cross. We were rightly condemned, said the thief on the cross, who bore a true testimony. He was a true living witness as to the righteousness of God. He says, have you no shame? Have you no shame? We deserve this. He said it. He said it with his own mouth. And he's going to be with Jesus in that Parisian footstool paradise when he comes into his kingdom. Behold the man. Fascinating. And you don't know these things. Verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the son of man, Reuben. Second Adam, last Adam, ultra Adam. Arc Adam. Quintessential Adam. And Mo, as Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up as the second Adam. Reuben failed. The weakest water failed in his airship. Reuben, chief cornerstone, Adam, chief cornerstone, failed, defiled, lost the inheritance. There was one who lusted after the inheritance, who understood the value of it. His name is Jesus Christ, and he knew that for us, it would be everything to us. Is it everything to you, theologian boy? How about you, pastor, who loves to get up on the stage and prance around and have everyone sitting there healing your childhood wounds and validating you? Come on, you're a teacher of Israel. What are you doing? This is all of our reality. We have Jesus Christ. We are to look to him and whom was pierced, hanging between heaven and earth. Verse 15 says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the true inheritor. The true inheritor, a firstborn. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have that paradise, eternal life. Face to face with God in cosmic opulence, 
lavished with the tender beauties and harmony of God. Yahweh Rishi. God heals. God is restored. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Praise God. Revelation chapter. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation. Are you seeing it here, you guys? Are you seeing it here? Are you seeing where we're going to get into the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ? And all the apostles recognized it. He's in the very corner of the high priest breastplate right here. The chief cornerstone. And God builds the entire thing on his, quote, sonship. His being the natural heir. Him being the rightful heir. Him being the covenantal son of man. Heir, behold the man. The faithful witness, four gospels here, book of John, the firstborn from the dead, the book of Luke, the rulers of the kings of the earth, the book of Matthew, to him who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, the book of Mark. Four flags, right? The ox, the lion, the man, the eagle. And has made us what? Kings and priests, fellow heirs, co-heirs. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. He is the rightful heir. He coveted after what we should have been coveting after. Amen. Behold, the man, he's coming in the clouds and every eye shall see him. Even they who pierced him, behold the man. He's hanging between heaven and earth. Your teacher in Israel, you don't understand. We have a chief cornerstone that did a redo for all the history of humanity, and it was God himself who bore our humanity. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of him, because we're guilty. He bore our shame. He bore our guilt. He bore our curse, and he was dipped and rolled in blood in the battle gear of a high priest, of a Levite. Even so, amen. And what does he say at that point? I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the I am I am the very redo and I am the reality the summary of all things. I am the chief cornerstone. I am he who is, who was and who is to come the almighty think praise God that of all the things that he brought to bear to the case of humanity he brought him who was life eternal who had no beginning no end the book of Hebrews makes us abundantly clear we needed the minimum of infinity To stand before God and say, impute the merits of a perfected man who has bore every single obligatory right of a covenant and an oath. I swore by an oath. I did it based upon my own righteousness. I am saving them according to my righteousness, says Christ. I lived out the covenant of man and I did it according to my works. Yes, we are saved by works, by the works of another man. And that's why the Sabbath is so essential. Because it is a sign and a seal that we are memorializing the fact that God has done a work that none of us could have done. And we present that work as a finished work to God. And we are well-pleasing in his nostrils. And we will bear um, the riches and the eternal reward based upon the works of another man's righteousness in which he entered into. He shouldered, he yoked. And he entered into the struggles and the crucible of a requirement to fulfill all covenantal righteousness. We made an oath before God to keep all the law of God and to be pleasing in his sight, to love him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our fellow men and ourselves. Nothing was more summarized and quintessentially, essentially showcased than that reality in the person and the work of Jesus Christ himself, the ultra man. The covenant man relying upon the father as a man would and then bringing to bear with the infinite qualities of him also being the son of God and him being the no beginning, no end, eternal reality that we need an application to all of our sins 
to represent all and any and whosoever shall come to God with an infinite capacity, we needed an infinite one, the very one whom, whom we violated and whom we sinned against and whom we have shamed into an open shame. We violated the marriage bed in the Garden of Eden, and we've done it every day of our lives since then. We've come from the loins of Adam. And the horrifying reality is, is we have shamed God through the town, through, through the cosmic village. We dragged around his name. Oh, I'm his wife, and we're just a nasty, crooked, lying, mouthy, out of control whore. And it is embarrassing to the angels. We are the prodigal child. We are Gomer to Hosea. And they're all looking at him saying, wow, look how awesome and majestic and holy this King Solomon was supposed to be a picture of in Shulamite. And, and look at her. Look at what a horrible, shameful thing. And then she's she is bringing you to an open shame before an entire watching cosmic universe that is watching the great conflict between good and evil. And this is the one that you're choosing to marry. And the only way you're going to reconcile this thing is by bearing her debt. Where is the repentance? Where's the brokenness? Where is us beholding the man and seeing in whom we pierced? This was the one who laid down his life. And this very life was the very life that we violated. We polluted. We shamed. Aren't, is there no shamefacedness in the bride of Christ anymore? Are we all with the far, harlot's forehead and we don't care? And I don't care. We're rolling our neck, getting all nasty all the time. And we're texting our little side boyfriend as we're saying, mm -hmm, I love you with our weird cigarette breath as we're trying to make out with God. Wow, guys. Wow. Where's the repentance? Where's the brokenness? Where's us seeing that? This is our privilege. Where is our lust for the birthright? Galatians 3, 10 through 14 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. We cannot wash ourselves as we are drenched in blood. Our bar of soap is blood soap. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Who is that? Reuben, the first Adam? Our shaky, unstable promises to God are ropes of sand that we make all these covenant notes and no, no, no. I'm sorry. Israel made the same covenant. Yes, oh God, we're we're fulfilling all, all righteousness. No, they weren't. They became the God-killing machine. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by what? Faith. How come the gospel is not good enough for some people? They don't bring the infinite requirements of righteousness that is that is absolutely minimal before a holy righteous god do you think his wife is going to be anything less than infinitely righteous if the law is not a faith but the man who does them shall live by them you enter into covenant well who did that for us who bore something we couldn't bear christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us sardis Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Garments dipped and rolled in blood. Shame, guilt. The idea of a curse is the constant issuing of blood. The woman of 12 years, all of our righteousness are filthy rags. That is menstrual rags. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, which is us. In Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith in that man's covenantal perfection. The just shall live by faith, you guys. We live by another man's perfection, our bridegroom. Any amens?
Look at this great quote. I love this quote. Interesting quote. It's from Manuscript 67, 1898. It says, In consenting to become man, Christ has manifested a humility that is the marvel of the heavenly intelligences. In itself, the act of consenting to be a man would be no act of humiliation were it not for the fact that Christ's exalted pre-existence, no beginning, no end, he is rightfully God, creator, Yahweh, and the fallen condition of man. <laughs> but when we opened our understanding to realize that in taking humanity upon him, Christ laid aside his royal robe, Philippians 2, his kingly crown, his high command, and clothed his divinity with humanity that he might meet man where man was. How far down did he go? And bring to the human family moral power to become the sons and daughters of God. To redeem man, Christ became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, the shame, the guilt. Sardis, you see the pictures there? See them? This is our sonship right here. This is how we can be called sons of God. This is the true currency of heaven. He became the bloody man. Remember Zipporah said to Moses, bloody man, bloody husband. This is who Christ is. Bore the blood, shed his blood, sweat the blood, and pleads his blood in our behalf. Yeah, it's gruesome. Remember, the, we're going to get into the prophecy of him whose garments are rolled in blood and how he defeats the enemy based upon his bloody garments. Look at my blood that was shed for them. Have we no shame for what we have accosted and assailed <coughs> and abused and assaulted Christ with? Weren't people pricked to the heart when they realized when the Holy Spirit fell upon them that we put him up on Calvary's cross? We've crucified him. We must be born again. We cannot be of the blood of Adam. We need the blood of the second Adam pleading in our behalf, standing perfect and pleasing before the eternal father. We need his perfect mediation on our behalf. Amen. The humanity of the son of God is everything to us or we would have no access to heaven. It is the golden link chain which binds our souls to Christ through Christ to God. He is Jacob's ladder. He is the eternal highway. He is the great gulf that has been fixed, but now he has joined the two infinite separated parties together. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. Son of man. That's what he mediates in the book of Daniel chapter 7. And he was God in the flesh. And when we approach the subject of Christ's divinity, clothed with the garb of humanity, is that a casual subject? Is that something that we should just kind of lightly just drive by at 500 uh, miles an hour, goofing around, flipping through the radio as God's trying to somehow get our attention on this? We may appropriately heed the word spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Quote, put off thy shoes. From off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest is holy ground. You're at the foot of Calvary's cross. You see who's up there? God is up there. Bearing your guilt, your sins. And we are too good to confess them. We're too proud to own them. We must come to the study of the subject with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart. The study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field and will repay the searcher who digs deep for the hidden truth. Is that not absolutely beautiful to understand that? Come on.
So we're going to really look at, we're going to move into the second part of this study more a little more deeper as to how Christ is that second Adam, how he is the, quote, chief cornerstone. And this is the stone that is cut out without hands that destroys the kingdom of Satan. Satan will no longer have a claim upon us as his children, his dominion, his citizenship heirs. He's taken on the dominion of the first Adam. Satan, in getting Adam to fall, to fall under his dominion, now bears the, quote, dominion of Adam. That's why he's called the prince of the power of the air, the god of this age, of this world. And now he's going to be condemned with a, quote, covenant, which he entered in through Adam falling. He was given the dominion of Adam. But now God's going to require the righteousness that was required of Adam from Satan. But he didn't come in the form of an angel. Christ did not come and bear the garb of, quote, angel material, so to speak. Satan's going to be filtered out through the process by the very fact that he got Adam to sin to bear that whole dominion guilt of humanity in the sense that humanity is under the dominion sway of Satan. And the covenant of failure and consequence that went to the first Adam is now going to roll upon Satan who is bearing that, quote, dominion as a god of this age and the prince of the power and a lion who has dominion authority seeking in whom he can devour and he's creating a dominion kingdom upon this earth with human beings in tandem because that's what he's caught up in. He's caught up in a Leviathan relationship with human beings. That's a study into itself. We'll get into that in the book of Revelation a little further. Yeah, he ended up with the human family under his dominion, but he's also going to have to be a Gog and a versus a Magog situation. He's the Gog. He's Agag. And he's married to the land. And he's going to be stuck on earth for a thousand years while the saints reign with Christ in heaven, getting their reward. And he will be judged on this earth like Christ shed his blood on this earth. And you will see that this whole covenant thing with the first Adam and how it's rolled upon Satan at the Day of Atonement is fascinating, the concept of the Azazel scapegoat. Don't miss that study. <clears throat> so, resurrection, eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49, the scripture tells us that the first man, Adam, which is a Reuben picture, became a living person, but the last Adam, which is Christ, Christ says you need to be saved by the spirit man, the quickened man, the eternal man. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the ground, while Christ, the second man, Joseph was typified in that. Reuben had failed, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man. Do you see this? And the heavenly people are like the heavenly man in covenant. That's why we're going to get a new body. That's why we're going to stand before God, literally. Right now, we do covenantally through our high priest. We're being represented by Jesus Christ, but it has not yet been swallowed up. Death in the grave has not been swallowed up yet. When it is, we will have that realized. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man on that day, right? That concept is the essential picture in the book of Romans where he says for chapter five, verses six through 19, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Reuben, who defiled the bed. Adam, who defiled the bed. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But this covenant, remember, he's hung upon a tree. He's like a serpent hanging between heaven and earth, a cursed thing, bearing shame, guilt, reproach, and the curse that fell upon humanity. That's how we're saved, you guys. 
not because we're so perfect, but because we're able to lay a hold of the guilt that we truly have before God in the books of heaven. And that we lay hold of him who became a curse for us, where the handwriting of ordinances of that record that was against us was bore by Christ. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, Sardis. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, thief on the cross, Remember me when you come into your Persian empire after the destruction of Babylon. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, a second Adam, a life-giving spirit. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Here's Jacob's ladder right here, you guys. There it is. Reconciliation. You see it? Therefore, just as one man's sins entered into the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Why? Because we are in constituted, we're in the loins of Adam, we are under his posterity. By nature, and you're a teacher of Israel and you don't get it. You're a teacher amongst God's people and you don't understand the fundamentals of headship of Jesus Christ and of Adam. Catholic Church doesn't get it. It says that we don't bear any guilt from the sins of Adam. Yes, we get a terrible nature. We get gypped on a perfect nature, but that's not condemnable. <laughs> you know, <coughs> that's what <coughs> the Catholic Church teaches. That's its version of original sin. The Bible teaches that you are covenantally defiled and you're morally defiled, and both disqualify you. Title and fitness, disqualified. So important to understand this, saints. Because all have sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, God made covenant. There's not acknowledgement of the law. We don't know the law. God had to re-showcase the law and re-reveal the law upon Mount Sinai. But it says, okay, now it's imputed to you. You're culpable. So lay a hold of the righteousness that I have provided for you through the atonement in which I bore your sins. Is that really so hard to understand, theologian, with your puffy hat and your scroll with a ribbon around it? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even says so. Obviously, we were obviously bearing the curse of the covenant. Because there was death all the way from Adam to Moses. Even we could say, well, we're ignorant. We didn't know all the details of the Ten Commandments. Well, it's evident that obviously we're not in covenant with God. Even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of our Adam, which is knowingly, willfully, we are constituted dead because of loins, because of covenant under Adam, because we're of one blood in Adam. We need a covenantal second Adam. It's impossible. How are we going to do an entire human redo unless him who is the beginning, the end, the first and last, the author and the finisher, the, um, the um, alpha, the omega, or the Aleph, Tau. The one who is infinity within himself. He is all things. He is the essential reality of that which is so. We need God to come in the flesh and to reconstitute us and give us a, quote, non-starting date of infinity in Jesus Christ. This is the minimum that you present before God in this epic, epic tragedy that has raped the entire universe, defiled the bed of God.
Oh, no. Oh, no, I don't think we're getting it. Who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. This is a mess you can't clean up, you guys. This is too big. The sewage has has soaked into everything. This is a murder scene. For if by one man's offense, many died, the many, the offspring that came from the loins of Adam, much more the grace of God by the gift of the, uh, by the grace of the one man, Christ Jesus abounded to many. How? It's impossible because of his infinite position. The gift is not like that which came to the one that sinned for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But this gift is a redo. It's impossible to pay off this debt for the wages of sin is death. But this gift is so powerful that it swallows up death and imputes an eternal life to you. And then he imparts it to you. And then at his coming is fully realized in glory. Real infinity before God in an actual body where you get to eat and enjoy and be in fellowship and have sentient consciousness. The gift, free gift, which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Christ died as the federal head of humanity. I didn't have to use the word federal. Of the head of humanity, the second Adam. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through the one, the inheritor, the only begotten, the basar, the elect, chosen, firstborn. That's where the word body comes from, bizarre, like you go to a market and all things are gathered in one place. All the inheritance is brought forth and assembled in one human being. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he happens to come in the eternal realities. And he has reset humanity in himself. Praise God. What a gift. It is unfathomable. You can't be measured. You don't know the height, the depth, the width, the breadth. You can't measure this thing. Yet we fail to praise him. And to, and, and to adore him. Jesus Christ. Therefore, and forget about committing our lives to him. Forget about wanting to glorify him. Forget about seeing this life as a temporary, you know, light affliction, no matter what the trials are, that this is nothing to bear to glorify Christ because you're going to spend it in infinity with the gift that he brought out through an infinite humiliation and sacrifice and a shame and a scarring to his own soul. What a mediator. What a long-suffering, compassionate mediator for the blind and the ignorant. Till that Holy Spirit animates us and pierces us who have no appreciation on Calvary's cross. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all resulting condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of Life, righteousness, perfection, right standing with God, eternal life, paradise. Dwelling with him face to face, restored, reconciled, and brought back into the bedchamber. Song of Solomon stuff, you guys. For as by one man's disobedience, many were constituted, made, and rectified, I mean, uh, reckoned as sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be, quote, made righteous. Now, this is what's so important to really understand. And that is, we need to see who's mediating on our behalf. The book of Daniel chapter 7, if you want to see the judgment of God, God gives us full inheritance based upon one that's in the book of Daniel called the Son of Man. He's not even called the Son of God. It is the righteous merits of the mediation of the man covenant with God. And he looks upon Jesus Christ and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He has fulfilled all righteousness for the sake of humanity. 
if you just go back and you reread the book of Hebrews with this pair of eyes, the whole book would just break open to you. It will be like a giant fountain with diamonds and rubies pouring out of it. And artesian water. It'll be like this great well of effervescent life and extravagance that he promised to the Samaritan woman at the well at the noonday sun. Because this is our access to the eternal, opulent, lavishing of a face-to-face -face with God. And it's so amazing of a gift that he says, you are now my wife. He likens us, a thief in the night, this whole picture of him coming as a Bedouin raider with his long hair. And he's coming on his white steed with all of his friends. And he says, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And he comes as a thief in the knife to steal a bride away from these tents of the earth, from the wicked tents, from the hostile tents of this world. He comes and snatches a wife that Satan has kidnapped, and is holding hostage. And he comes as a thief in the night. Look at all the laws in regard. We'll look at this in our study. What are the laws of a thief of the night? Kill him because he's come with bad intentions. And when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory on that day, he's coming with bad intentions for Satan because he is here to take the prey out of the mouth of the lion and destroy that lion. He will be sequestered for a judgment and he will be put to death. Whether you understand this or not, it doesn't matter. It's true. I'm telling you the truth. This is true what I'm saying. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he's coming as a as a raider in the middle of the night and he's coming down off his great mountain and he is going to get his wealth, his portion, his treasure, his jewels. And nothing will stop him. He will raise those jewels out of the dust bed. He will resurrect them and he will enliven them. And those who are standing and remain at that time, he will change in the moment, in the twinkle of an eye, and they will be the constellation of his jewels that he will snatch from this hostile, tented world. That's the picture. That is the picture. This is Sardis. He has paid for her in blood. You think he's not coming for what is rightfully his own? What a purchase price, what passion, what zeal, what jealousy, what vengeance. So he's pictured in this majestic warrior outfit. Did you know that the high priest is a picture of God going to war with Satan? It is a, it is a, it is a warrior's garment. He's got a breastplate, he's got a helmet. When you are looking at the quote, breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. It's not talking about Roman soldiers. It's talking about the high priest in which it is a picture in which Jesus Christ is mediating as an advocate and he's going to war, imputing life and righteousness to our account. So there is no dominion of sin and death when Satan is sitting there pleading, saying, this is my dominion. This is my wealth. You can't take them. And he contended over Moses' body saying, what do you mean he sinned against you? There's no way you can have them. This is mine. And Jesus came down in Michael garb, warrior garb, and says, don't you touch him. I have redeemed him. I have purchased him. The Lord rebukes you. Moses, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Great multitude, come forth. 144,000 come forth out of the mouth of the lion. He has no dominion over you because I have mediated my life and my righteousness. I paid the debt for your sins. I have lived out perfection and righteousness before an infinite standard, which is the law of God. And I'm pleading for them because I am the second Reuben. I'm the second Adam. I have what you meant for evil, God meant for good. I am now Joseph, and my children are now the inheritors. And he's mediating that righteousness in the book of Daniel chapter 7. The judgment is based upon, the wrath of God is based upon the qualities of Jesus Christ as the son of man. He's majestic. He's a warrior. He is triumph in his war.
So let's look at this Odom, Adam High Priest, this red priest. The punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of the people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. Judgment, condemnation upon this Nazarite, which was overthrown in a moment with no hand to help. Her Nazarites were brighter than snow, whiter than milk. You're going to see the Song of Solomon. You're going to see the book of Revelation. You're going to see the book of Daniel here. They're more ruddy. This is the word. Sardis. In body than rubies. Like sapphire in their appearance. Now their appearance is blacker than soot. Christ. They go unrecognized. See this here? They did not recognize him. He was be beyond recognition. He was so marred that he wasn't even like a man. He was treated like an animal, like, like a slaughtered lamb. Christ is bearing our shame and guilt in his nobility. Their skin clings to their bones became as dry wood. Why did Christ say I thirst? Why did he say I thirst? This is Christ. Paying the price for our sins, the bull of Bashan has surrounded him. They're like dogs ripping him to pieces. Eli, Eli Lama Sabachthani, right? Making me thirsty is talking about. Here's the same man, Revelation 1, 12 through 20. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. This is the one in the midst of the candlesticks, the seven churches. And I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst of the seven candlesticks is what? Reuben, one like unto the son of man, Adam. He's clothed with the garment down to his foot like Joseph. Gird about with the paps of the golden girdle. Coat of many colors, the high priestly garment. His head was his head and his hairs were white like wool. That's Daniel chapter 7. You guys, that's the mediation of Jesus Christ. Him and the Father are one. And he's mediating his oneness with the Father. He's mediating us and saying, Look upon them, John chapter 17, in which he's the heavenly high priest, saying, Look upon them as you look upon me, that they are one, and that we are one, and that you are one with them because of me. White as snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. As they burned in a furnace, the earth is his footstool. And that's why the earth becomes as a liquid lava lake. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. We'll get into that as we get into another study on Sardis. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. Look at this majestic high priest, this warrior man, this great Nazarite who fights on our behalf, who goes to war with our enemy, this lion. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet dead, and he laid his right hand upon me and said unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I'm the, <coughs> I'm the new Adam mediating on your behalf. You have right standing with God. You're going to have to understand this before we get into the unsealing of the scrolls and who is worthy. This is essential that we understand this. You're not going to understand the book of Revelation unless you understand exactly what we're talking about right now, that Christ is the chief cornerstone, the head, and because of his beauty and his merits and his perfection and everything that pleases God, it's standing before the Father on our behalf. We are well-pleasing to him, and therefore he lavishes us with the Holy Spirit. Don't come to God in your own righteousness. Can you please come to God hid in the righteousness of your mediator, your substitute, and your surety? Your ambassador. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Sounds like Sardis to me. Strengthen those things that remain, which is what? You're standing with God in Jesus Christ, who is invisible to us, but who is at the right hand of God. Lay a hold of him by faith. He is the anchor to the soul beyond the veil. Amen, which is this idea of Amana.
established. Verily, verily, it is so. And have the keys of hell and death. Don't be afraid of the dominion of Satan. Be afraid of the dominion of Jesus Christ in which there is no comeback. When he makes final judgment, you better be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and your name therein. So he sees you and recognizes you in the books and then he raises you from the dead based upon covenantal reality because Christ is the reality of the scroll of God. He is the word of God incarnate. He is everything that was ever promised. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Our entire history is in the past, present, and future in Jesus Christ. He is the living document made manifest perfection. All of our hope is in him. When Satan's getting to look at your past or getting you to dread the future or getting you terrified of your present standing, cast those away. Put your care upon Christ for he cares for you. Be anxious for nothing. If you're going to be anxious about anything. Be anxious about how God thinks of Jesus Christ. And if you believe that Jesus Christ is in good standing with the Father, Cast your faith upon him, and that is your status too. Lay a hold of that. Satan hates you to hear this truth. He hates you to break his spell and his power and his voice and his condemnation and his shaming and you not having the confidence that God loves you enough to lay down his life for you. What a second, Adam. His enemies he does this for. Don't doubt him. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. This is the lamp that God is constantly trying to keep us in the light in. So we have victory. He who overcomes, listen to what the spirit says to the seven churches. Christ is your mediator. He is your cornerstone. He is the rock of offense. He is the stone cut out without hands and destroys the very kingdom of Satan that's made in his own image. And the seven candlesticks which you saw the seven churches. You want to see the same man again? The same mediator, the same high priest, the same warrior priest king? Daniel 10 verses 5 and 6 says, I lifted my eyes and looked. This is the whole second Reuben. A certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with the gold of Uphaz. This is this picture of separating the gold and the silver. This is the Sardis man. His body was like burl. His face was like appearance of lightning and his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and her feet like burnished bronze in color. The sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Is this not speaking of the same intermediator, advocate? He's zealous in his advocacy for us. He, he brings to bear his righteousness is our standing with God who holds all dominion and everything's going to be destroyed by the brightness of his coming and his eternal wrath that will Turn everything into powder and ashes and nothing will have any standing with Christ outside of Christ. Christ is the standing alone that you can have with God. Then he'll create a new heaven, new earth. Earth itself will be destroyed. There's no place anymore for the wicked. Satan locked himself into a covenant when he made man fall. Now he got locked up and there he is stuck on earth and stuck in a Leviathan, Gog, Magog relationship with humanity in which God will destroy him in his association with that fall. Aren't you praising God for this whole Sardis concept? I'll read a little bit more, and we'll have to kind of part to this, this red mediator thing. Oh, it's so good. I don't know when I should stop, but I, I don't want to wear you guys out too much. I know that these are heavy-duty studies. Song of Solomon, the same picture. This is our high priest, you guys. This is the warrior who mediates on our behalf because Satan is there as an accuser saying, I have dominion. They're, they're under my suggestions. I give a command. They follow me. Therefore, they're my children. Harden not your heart. What the Spirit does, leading you to lay a hold of Christ and have trust and faith in him. And then he's there to stoke your zeal and your passion, your love for Christ, because that's what the Holy Spirit does in Romans chapter 5. What does he do? He pours and sheds abroad the very love of Christ so you endure trial and temptation and everything. What is trial and temptation to do? Satan is trying to get you to let go of the hem of his garment. He's trying to get you to relinquish that and then enter into Satan's dominion, enter into his suggestions, enter into his lordship, enter into him being your Baal, your husband, your lord, your king, Molech, king, where you're under his dominion. 
You listen to him. You obey him. He makes you fear and tremble. And you go to him for provision. Trial in faith is Satan coming to bear and trying to bring his wrath upon you. So you relinquish your hold in Christ. And it says the Holy Spirit will get you to keep a hold of Christ's robe of righteousness. Do you know why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart and you would rather die than knowingly commit a sin against the person in whom you love supremely like he loves you supremely. Yes, Paul says I sound like a crazy man, but this crazy man is sane for you. This is sanity. It's insane to follow Satan. If you really knew these truths, you'd be insane to follow him who will perish in the end and has no reward for you, right? Look at this man a little bit more. This is her talking, describing him. Do we describe Christ in such glowing terms? Do we have the eye salve, Laodicea? Do we really see him? Are we beholding the man? Do we see what's going on here? Have we been pierced by the fact that we've pierced him? That he's laid down his life, that he humbled himself in an infinite humility to bear our guilt, shame, and then we despise him, we project upon him, we lavish him with what? A crown? He deserved a crown, but what crown did we give him? He deserved a robe, but what robe did we give him? He deserved an audience before the great leadership of his people. But what did we do? What was the feast? What was the meal that we gave him? What was his welcome? What was his reward? What did we do to Christ when he showed up here? We deicided him. We God killed. We tore him to pieces and he told us we would do it. And then we said, no, we would never do that. God says, well, who'd believe my report? Who would believe that I would show up in the flesh and you would tear me to pieces? In fact, I had to illustrate it by tearing up some bread, pouring out some wine, saying, you see, that's me. We're like, no, that might be everyone else. That's not me, God. And God says, oh, yeah, that's you. That's you. And you're going to have to admit it. And you're going to have to own it. And you're going to have to be culpable to it. So the very blood that was shed by your hands or by my hands in our culpability is also the same blood that pleads eloquently for us because God died for guilty sinners who are culpable confessing. God, this confession avoidance is a sickening disease amongst the body of Christ. We just can't seem to just own the fact that we are wretched sinners, that we are God-killing wolverine cannibals. Christ is the true firstborn. Look how majestic he is, white and ruddy, chiefest among 10,000. His head is like the finest of gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven, rich, dark, soil, providing. His eyes are like, what? Doves, devoted. For life, Holy Spirit. By the rivers of waters, washed with milk, fitly set, completely locked in on you, has not eyes for another. That's what that means. His cheeks are a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. Are our cheeks shamefaced like pomegranates? His cheeks, lahi, which is the word for the tablets, the two tablets are a picture of God's cheeks, which we smite the one, and he turns the other. Okay, you don't love me. Well, do you? Love your brethren in whom you do see. His lips are lilies, which is what? It's a word for trumpet in a sewage pit. We live in the sewage. We live in the valley of the shadow of death. We live in the poisoned dead water. And yet from that, we trumpet praises. And that's what the word lily means. Christ is the true ultimate picture of the praise of God, the only bright spot in this valley of the shadow of death. We should be trumpeting his praises. Dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with burl. His body is carved ivory laid with those sapphires and his legs are pillars of marble set on bases of gold. His countenance is like the refreshing pines of Lebanon. Excellent as the cedar wood. His mouth is 
is most sweet. Yes, what are his words? I love you. I'm laying my life down for you. Be faithful to me. I'll forgive you. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem, that we may walk together at even time. This is who's coming for his wife. This is who is zealous and jealous for us. This is the one who is swallowed up by the zeal for his reward, which is us. This is who possesses us. This is who overturned the money changer tables to give us access because we are the house of the poor. We're the ones who desperately need God. And do you know what's blocking the access? Theologians. The pomp people, the fuzzy hat people. The people who are proud of their knowledge and they're puffed up. They know nothing of trust and faith and humility. They're filled with pride. And God says he resists the proud. Did you know that God resists the proud? Did you know that he is a great defender of those who are coming naked and, and confessing like the, like the publican who came? Standing afar off, not so much as looking up, beating his breast? Why does he cloak that person with his righteousness? Why does he have sympathy and empathy upon the broken sinner? Why does he have nothing for those who are boasting their, their knowledge of what they could see and what they know and what they understand, and yet they don't know in their heart these real essential truths? They can spout them off to you like a good Pharisee, but nothing of a true heart, mind, soul, everything they're not the leper. They're not the harlot. They're not the tax collector. They're not the publican. They're not the Roman soldier. They're not the woman at the well. They come in all the pomp and circumstance of the high priest, thinking that they have the keys to the door to the church. This has always been the curse, the pride of man. And who is the author of that pride? Whose spirit do you partake of? With all the knowledge in the world, you think, all oh, this knowledge, this knowledge, this knowledge, but you don't have this knowledge for some reason. But you could break down the chiastic structure of the Greek and Hebrew, which I love. By the way, if it gives me any insight into Christ, great. But really for the self-serving so we can all say, Rabbi, Rabbi, you great teacher. You're so amazing to try to fill their what? Their feeble, weak as water ego? Let's take a look at this majestic bridegroom who is coming in a thief in the night rescue mission. Revelation 19, 11 through 16 says, now I saw heaven opened and behold the white horse. Here he comes, bridegroom, thief in the night, stealing his wife from the tents, the wicked tents of this world of Kedar. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is our heavenly high priest. This is the one that wears the breastplate. Let me go back to this real quick. You can see it. His eyes were like a flame of fire in his head, many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Why? Because he's the infinite, eternal fountain of life. And what is he going to lavish his wife with? Well, you're not going to know. No eye has seen, no ears heard. It's never entered into the heart of this woman that is going to be lavished with cosmic opulence throughout all of eternity. You're just going to have to be with him to find out what the whole thing is about. Verse 13. He was clothed with the robe dipped in blood. We're going to have to touch on that a little bit. We're going to have to look at the red mediator. The one who has got blood all over his garments like a good Levite out in the courtyard. This was a bloody work and this was a hellacious battle. Whether we could see it or not. God help us to see it. God help us to see it. This was war. This was war. He fought for humanity. He strove in this. His name is called the word of God, the covenant himself. He's the covenantor. 
And he became the covenant of the people, and it's in the book of Isaiah. Please look it up yourself. He made a promise. He is the promissory covenant. He swore it to bear upon himself everything that was required of humanity, including the debt. And he didn't just make a covenant. My friends, he became the covenant. It says that he became the covenant of the people. He's everything that we should be promising to God, and it's made manifest right in front of God, at the right hand of God. If God needs righteousness, put your name in the ledgers of the book of heaven. Look no further than Jesus Christ, and then run and flee and hide to him. He is your righteousness, and he is your right standing before God in heaven. Look how jealous he is. I love this. In righteousness, he judges and makes worse. His eyes are like a flame of fire, many crowns. Name written that no one knew except himself. He knows his rewards for you. Dipped in blood, the word of God. Is he a warrior on the warpath? His armies in heaven? Yeah, he's what Joshua was to the children of Israel. Clothed in the fine linen, white and clean. Followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth, here we go, same ones. His authority, a sharp two-edged sword. Dividing down to the thoughts and intent of the heart, the marrow. This is a battle of the soul, whether you know it or not. And that with it, he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Talk about getting the dominion back and making the earth a footstool and getting the rewards of an only begotten basar. An elect chosen one, a holy one, the redeemer, Israel himself, the one who prevailed with both God and man. He himself treads the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of God, and it makes his garment bloody. You're going to see it. And he has on his robe and on his thigh name the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is where you get the word Molech and Baal from. So let's look at this quote Red Mediator, who mediates between heaven and earth for man. Boy, I hope you see it. Hope we see it. Let's go to Genesis 37, verse 31. So here's Joseph. This is the one who his tunic was dipped in blood. Who took the place of Reuben, a picture of the second Adam. So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in blood. How about the, is, is, is this a priest role? Is this a Levitical role? Leviticus chapter 9, verse 9 says, And the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and put it on the horns of the altar, and poured the blood on the base of the altar. This is a bloody event. The courtyard was a bloodbath. What about his righteous dominion? What about his government? What about the fact that he rules in this concept of being, quote, the blood-dipped God? Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when he first, at first, he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. Messiah was coming from Galilee, folks, and he's at war. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, us, upon them the light has shined. Christ says, I'm the light of the world. The warrior king has come to do battle, to bring us from darkness to light, from death to life, to filthiness to righteousness, to condemnation the sonship. Verse 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. The Septuagint reads, most of the people you brought down into your joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Our riches and inheritance are in Christ. For you have broken the yoke of the burden and the staff off the shoulder the rod of his oppressor, which he delivered us from, but he had to do it in a bloodbath where he had to bear our shame and guilt. And the sword had to fall upon him. 
and the staff on his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the days of Midian, which is the word for strife. Midian means strife. Look up words. For, are you ready for this? Every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood, a Joseph picture. God's been sign languaging this to his people forever and ever and ever. I'm going to have to get into the bloodbath. I'm going to have to go down to the valley. I'm going to have to do war. And I'm going to have to beat this giant. And it's going to be a bloody battle. But I will prevail as the firstborn so you can have right standing with God and receive the inheritance. Praise God that he's entered and shouldered and yoked himself with our condemnation, shame, guilt, and curse. And this was the battle that he went to go wage warfare on was death in the grave and condemnation from a lion. All garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. This is the context where you see, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. Reuben part. <coughs> Reuben 2.0, second Adam, last Adam. Born again. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Yeah, he shouldered it. He yoked. Shechem. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Humanity, Prince of Peace, the one who went to fight to give us peace with God under a great cosmic conflict and warfare. And it cost him his life. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Why? Because he is eternal and his reward is eternal. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establishment and the judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts has performed this. Ah, there we go. There we go. Now, I won't get too much into this because we're going to have to really get into Christ bearing our sins. I'm going to, so we're already at two hours. I'll stop it here. But you're going to see that this is what Satan tried to, this is the warfare. We'll get into that next time. What's the first stone mentioned where Satan looked to ascend? Sardis. The very first thing it says that Satan right here, lamentation, that you were a signet of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty. You were in Eden, in the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering, Sardis. He wished to be the, quote, firstborn inheritor. This is what he wished to ascend more than anything else, Adam. The very first thing he wished to have dominion over was Adam, and that's why he caught Adam so early on before he ended up having offspring. He got the entirety of the human posterity in the loins of Adam before he started having offspring. We'll get into that to the next study. Isn't this fascinating? So what basically are we establishing here? This is a governmental warfare in which we are the recipients of an everlasting inheritance, and Christ had to become the, quote, firstborn, the elect, the chosen, the inheritor, the covenantal centerpiece in which all things constellate around him. Whatever words you need to understand that he is the very reference point that God needs because everything's been handed to him. The book of Daniel makes it clear that everything's been handed to him. All dominion, authority, inheritance, everything handed to him. He deserved it. He earned it. That is the reward for his war. He went as a prince, as a sar. Is sar, uh, this whole idea of Israel. It's sar, ish, sar, rael. It's talking about that this is the one who fought the battle, went in and strived and prevailed and got the reward and prevailed with man as a man and prevailed with God as a God and man. And he became the rightful inheritor of all things. And the father just handed everything over to him. And then it says in the book of Daniel that he hands everything over to us. Where is the gratitude? Where is the life of like, okay, I want to glorify him. Where is our tears? Where is our praise? Where is our love? Where is our affection? Where is our communion? Where is our conversations? Where is our life is, is given over to a Thanksgiving offering? Not for merit, but as gratitude, as thanks. This is why Satan is doing everything he can to cast the sanctuary to the ground, trample it underfoot, to cast the truth to the ground, to trample it underfoot. Everything about Satan is trying to close up 
and trying to destroy. He did it when you had the medieval Catholicism throughout the 1260-year prophecy in which they wanted to become the mediatorial reality in which you behold. What a monstrosity that is. And what did it do? It sealed up the mediation of Jesus Christ in heaven, and God had to use the Reformation to get our eyes fixed back on our substitute and surety in which we are justified by faith through another man's righteousness who is mediating on our behalf, not because of saints, not because of uh, Mary, not because of all this strange order of things in which this is all kind of this amalgamated mess here on this earth with this magisterium. Cast that aside. Cast out the bond woman. You have one mediator in heaven, and you have one righteousness in which you have standing with God. And Satan will do everything to destroy the simplicity of the gospel. He'll use theologians to do it, so-called. Get you caught up in trifling things, and you lose this, this, this reality of the gospel. Why do you think in these last days God is restoring our understanding that we are mortal beings, that we have no life in ourselves, and immortality and life is in Christ alone? Why do you think God is restoring that? So we make no mistake to assume that we have divinity and righteousness and life within ourselves, that we are not the substance of God. We are the image of God, and there is no life in an image. Life is in Christ alone, and in him alone is immortality. Why did God restore the fact that we are immortal? You eat of this and you shall surely die. We're like, no, not really. For how many years now? These early so-called Nicene church fathers and which is somehow promoting our immortality and which these supposed theologians are addicted to that idea. Why? Because it's a divine God status. Surely you shall be as gods. You shall not surely die. These are theologians keeping this alive. Flee from that. Flee from Babylon. The scripture is clear. We are mortal and we shall go to the dust of the ground, and we are going to perish in a second resurrection if we not have the eternal, righteous, substitutionary life of Jesus Christ mediating in our behalf in which we can enjoy the return of Christ where we're changing the moment of a twinkle of an eye and we put on immortality at that moment or we're given the cloak of immortality upon the resurrection. God is trying to spare us of such arrogant, presumptuous pride and fantasy that we are somehow mystical, eternal creatures, which we are not. That is Satan blowing into our ear with his creepy forked tongue, licking our eardrum in some creepy way. Why do people have a problem with keeping the commandments of God in our sphere? Because we don't want to come under his lordship. We don't want to be having, like for the Sabbath, is a, is a sign and a memorial of what? That we are a bride under the lordship of him who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the land, and everything, and that he has worked a work of salvation in which we are here to bear a reflection of that glory and show that we are under his dominion, and we have the law of God written upon our hearts in a strange, wicked, twisted, defiled world. A wicked generation that is lawless and not under the dominion of the Holy Spirit of God, not having the law of God carved out upon our hearts, but we're under bondage. We have this supposed idea of liberty and freedom, and guess what? We are truly, truly in bondage, lawless workers of iniquity, presuming that we can call Lord, 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 and he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawless iniquity. You, 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 are not under my lordship. I am the Lord, your righteousness. You are my wife. Where is our sign? Where is our seal? Where is our picture of that we're under his dominion, that we're under his canopy, that we are under his finished works, and that we are here to glorify him as a woman is there to be the glory to her husband? Why, why are we fighting this? Why is God restoring this truth? Because the bridegroom comes, and he's coming. Why? He's jealous. Let's go back to this very last thing. It says that to order and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, are ready for this, the very last words, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He's jealous for his wife. He is jealous for us to come under his dominion. He's jealous for us to renounce the hidden things of darkness and shame and the evil, wicked connivings of the heart in which we're having fellowship and communion. We think God doesn't see us. The book of Malachi says, oh, how are we defiling you? How are we dishonoring you? And we're saying, wait a minute, you think I don't see? You think that I don't judge the wicked? You think that everything just goes on as, as what looks apparent to you? 
How dare we impugn God that he doesn't know the difference between good and evil? You better, we better, I better, we should all better say, God, what is, what should I depart from? What should I flee from? What should I separate from? This is all New Testament stuff. You could find everything I have to say in the New Testament. This is not David preaching works righteousness. This is David preaching the law of God written upon your heart. You have entered into the new covenant and you are his wife and his bride. And I show you a mystery and you are under his lordship and dominion. And Christ is your husband. Obey him, trust him, love him, glorify him. Right? He's a zealous God. Where is your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Lazy. And you're going to see this in the book of Sardis, even though he's reestablishing and reshowing himself as the Sardis, as the chief cornerstone. We're going to get into this on the next study very intensely. That in him lies all the wealth and righteous inheritance in which you can have confidence and right standing and boldness to come to the throne of grace. But your works are, are I, I have this against you. This is New Testament. You can't get any more New Testament in the book of Revelation. He says the same thing about the book of Ephesians. When there is good doctrine, it's weird how we just kind of chillax and we go, well, I mean, you know. When God gives us great light about Jesus Christ, it is not to sit back and to rest on our leaves and to get presumptuous. It says, do you don't want your, your love to be rekindled again? Go back to your first works in which you loved him with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Satan is going to destroy more people with presumption and this idea of resting upon our laurels, resting upon our lees. It's going to make us bitter. It's going to make us poison. It's going to spoil us and ruin us. Where are the Christians that are zealous to display the glory of God, to show the world that the law of God is written upon our hearts? Where is to love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, with all of your substance, with your time, with your words, with your affections, with your emotions, with your lifestyle, with your job uh, choices, with your influence in the family, with how you live, with how you think, with how you process, with how you manage your, your, your communion with God. Everything is to be touched by this. It is with the heart. The word in the Greek is cardio for all of you Greek freaks out there. Cardio means the entire circulatory system, your whole being should be caught up in this. And God says, you guys don't seem to have the zeal that I have for you. We're too busy worried about how passionate is God is for me. The Song of Solomon, Calvary's cross, is irrefutable evidence as to God's zeal for us. God is zealous for us unto the end. In fact, that's the wrath of God. He's coming. And the word jealous is the word nest. It is the word kanon or kano. Uh, uh, Canaan, that's the idea of, of kin, kinship. It's the idea of coming with jealousy. It's the, it's the wings of a, an eagle guarding her chicks. How much I would have gathered you. As a mother bird gathers her young, that's how I feel towards you. And yet you don't recognize me, yet you're ready to crucify me. And this was Christ weeping. This is where he wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, he wept because he's going to Jerusalem. And his people do not recognize him. They don't see his zeal. He swallowed up in zeal. He's there. He overturned the money changer tables. He dealt with a murder scene in which he was the victim of this murder. And he triumphantly, in his zeal, in his passion, in his love, he raised himself back up from the grave again, triumphantly ascended to heaven to plead on our behalf and we are non-plus and we are absolutely slack, slothful, so lazy that we turn upon our hinges that we don't even want to take our hand out of our armpit because we're afraid it might inconvenience us to go around glorifying God, to showing his beauty, his righteousness, his glory to the rest of the world. And somehow we think that that is going to play out in the end and work for us with a once saved, always saved false teaching mentality. Nothing is safe when you're listening to presumptuous words that say peace and safety when there is no peace and safety. Anything that feeds into your presumption, everything that feeds into your fantasy, everything that feeds into your lie, everything that feeds into your natural laziness is your enemy. Christ is zealous for you. That should in turn awaken a zeal and love for him. He loved us first. 
He should be awakening that love. He should be stirring something in you and me that we don't have by nature. By nature, we are selfish. By nature, we are lazy. By nature, we don't want to inconvenience ourselves. By nature, we don't want to sacrifice. By nature, we want everything to be pillowed. There is prophecies in the Old Testament says that you sew pillows on your elbows, on your wrists, on your armpits, everything else. You want this complete buffer zone where you're never pinched, you're never inconvenienced, everything, and you become the worst possible generation in the world in which you are vicious and narcissistic and selfish and like the Pharisees with your soft garments. You become a God-killing machine. We don't see that the solution that Satan has to make us God killers, to disqualify us from the return of Christ like he did on the first advent, is to turn us into a bunch of pampered, coddled, convenienced, self-serving, self-aggrandizing, self-glorifying babies. And he's done a perfect job of this generation. We can see it. We can see it. Culturally, we can see that this is the fall of civilization. We can see that we've created the biggest narcissist generation that's ever been developed in all the history of humanity. It's a it's it's seven billion Neros playing the violin while they burn Rome. You think Satan's hand is not in on all of this? Where are the saints that would give up life itself to glorify and to serve Christ? based upon the love of God shed abroad in their hearts because the Holy Spirit has poured upon them because they have looked and they have lived and they saw him who was pierced for us, our second Adam, Sardis, chief cornerstone, the bloody son. Anyway, guys, that's it for our study. <clears throat> We're going to have to uh, do a part two of Sardis. It's going to be such a powerful study. Put part two here. Let this quicken us. Let this liven us. If we are tired and uh, we've lost our zeal for God and the love of God is just not there in our hearts, I have one piece of advice. I used to go around all kinds of places, and uh, what I used was the, the formula that worked for me. And people used to love it because I used to study in the book Desire of Ages. It says, study the last hours of Christ's life. And all of a sudden, your love for him will awaken. He will somehow become fresh and relevant and alive to you. So I started studying obsessively everything I could from the foot wash. Because I was looking at John, it was just hours. John chapter 13, John. Well, if you look at John 12, John 13, John. It's all about the foot wash. John, There's two foot washes there. Mary washed his feet. He washes the disciples' feet. And then comes the communion service and then these big talks. And then it's John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and 17. This is all one night. This is all John is just literally marking the hours from the foot wash on to. And he was there. He was the witness. He was the only person that didn't take off running. And I became obsessed with from the foot wash. I started off with the. <coughs> foot wash with the alabaster box and then i go to the disciples foot wash and then we go all the way through that meal judas the walk crossing the kidron that whole talk around in my father's house are many mansions i'm going to go and depart don't be sad abide in the vine i'm the true vine i'm going to send the holy spirit he's going to remind you of all these things he goes and he prays in the garden he he prays the high priestly prayer. He's saying that, Father, make them one as we are one. And then he marches right into the hellscape of his judgment. And then he's abused and mocked and shamed. And we did everything that we could to rip him down from his throne. And then he finally lays up on Calvary's cross. And I did so much research and all that stuff, so much studying. And in fact, I'm still obsessed with it. If you saw my library a big part of my library is to study all the legal realities that happened there, all the historical stuff that I could find there, anything that I could find to give me insight into those last few hours of Jesus Christ. And it is absolutely life-changing. And so I recommend that we spend any time that we can on those last hours. If you feel far from Christ, spend time on those last hours. 
You will make no mistake in your mind as to how much God loves you. You need to know this. That's why after that tour of the Trial of Christ tour, I used to do the Song of Solomon because people did not understand the zeal of God and how intensely focused and impassioned he is, so much so that he was allowed to just, he ripped off his garments and he jumped in the water and says, this is a shark-infested water and I'm going to be torn to shreds, but at least they'll be saved. It's powerful stuff, you guys. All right, guys. Thanks for your attention, your time. We're at the two-hour hour mark. Thank you for being here. Pray for me. Pray for this ministry. Pray for my health. Pray for one another. And let's press on. We are at the last hours of this earth. We're headed into a great time of trouble, such as never since there was a nation or nations. We're headed wars, rumors of wars, and then comes demonic manifestations at levels that we have yet to have ever even calculated. We don't even know what Satan has in store for the grand finale. God help us. Be it UFOs, be it demonic manifestations, be it people supposedly raised from the dead that are our relatives speaking to us, whatever demonic falsehood nonsense that's coming our way, you guys. It's going to be something. It's going to be something. But our faith must be fixed upon Christ, and we are not to fall under the terror of the roaring mouth of the lion saying, I rule the earth, I have dominion over the earth, and because to tremble is to worship. To submit is to worship. To obey is to worship. To hear and to tremble and to comply is worship. It seems like in the minds of Christians today that compliance is not worship. If we comply to the world, we're not worshiping. If we comply to Caesar, we're not worshiping. Who has your heart? Who has authority? Who has dominion over you? On this earth, God is watching. Don't be ashamed of him. You want him to proclaim your name and not be ashamed of you in heaven as he's mediating for you? Stand tall as a child of God, even if it costs you your temporal life. Believe in the life and in the righteous resurrection of Jesus Christ. Stand for him. All right, everyone. God bless and thanks for being a part of this study.